Hi guys. Today I'm going to start reading you Glory Be. I remember I told you how this was one of my favorite, favorite read aloud books and it really is. And I didn't think it was fair for you guys to miss out on this amazing story um, because of our situation that we're in. So I'm going to break this up into quite a few days. There'll probably be maybe five or six lessons all together. So I'll read a couple of chapters. We'll stop at the end. I'll kind of give you some things to think about, um, and then we'll keep going with it. So you'll see the lessons for these posted on our Google Doc for our online learning um, lesson plans that I send you every week. So you can either choose to do all of the week's reading in a day. You can space it out between days. You can do it on the weekends when parents are home. It's totally up to you. The only way that I need you to show me that you've watched the video for the read aloud for your reading grade is to um, go to Google Classroom and you're going to click the assignment where it'll say Glory Be Day 1 or Day 2 or whatever and you are going to write on there a summary of what we read about or what I read to you. Okay, so today we're going to start with Glory Be. This is Day 1 by Augusta Scattergood, one of my favorite, favorite books of all time. Remember when we left um, school in March, we um, were reading about Martin Luther King Jr. and how he fought to end segregation so that all people, no matter what race you are, had equal rights. And with your reading um, this last week on Jackie Robinson and Rosa Parks, you read about also how they overcame that racism and that segregation and how unfair and unequal things were back then. So we're going to be reading Glory B. This is after segregation has ended. Martin Luther King Jr. has won. Segregation's declared illegal, and it's a great time. But there's still a lot of people, especially in the South, that are having a really hard time accepting that. And we're going to see that theme a lot in this story. So chapter one, couldn't hardly spit. What was taking Frankie so long? We needed to hurry. Franklin Cletus Smith had been my best friend since we hunted doodlebugs together in my backyard. Some people called him Frankfurter because he's got the hair the color of a hot dog. I call him Frankie. I squinted down the sidewalk and finally here he came, dragging his towel with his bathing suit hiked all the way up. It's a million degrees out here. I've been waiting forever. Well, hey to you too, Glory, he said. I stood up and grabbed my swimming bag. Where have you been? I cut through Mrs. Simpson's backyard. He wiped the sweat off of his glasses with the bottom of his t-shirt. And then I had to turn around and run down the alley when that her mangy old hound dog took off after me. Don't worry about that dog, I told him. He's half blind. He just barks at what he can't see. Some dogs run 40 miles an hour, he announced, like it was the gospel truth. Frankie was always saying stuff that sounded like it came straight from his world book encyclopedia. So, the word encyclopedia is something you may not have heard before. Back in the day, an encyclopedia was basically kind of like Google, but in a book, where you would go and look up what you were, um, what you were wondering about, or what you wanted to learn about. So if you were wanting to learn about dogs, you would take the book that had a D on it, you would look like you were in the dictionary for the word dog, and it would have a page um, of information about dogs. So now we can just type into Google and type dogs and search for information. But back before Google, then um, they didn't have that. I didn't have that. So we would go into the encyclopedia and we would look it up. And so back when this story was made, there obviously wasn't Google. And um, when it said he sounded like an encyclopedia, that means that he sounded like he knew everything about topics. Let's go, I said. It's so hot, I can't hardly spit. Just the lens already at the pool. She might up and decide she's bored and leave before I put my big toe in the water. I scratched at the mosquito bite and tugged at the bathing suit under my shorts. The backs of my legs were burning up from sitting on the concrete bench outside the library. I couldn't wait to feel the water's coolness to dive in and flutter kick all the way to the shallow end. Frankie yanked at his towel. I hope the pool's even open, he mumbled. Wait a minute, I said. It'll be open. I'm going swimming. Why would they close the community pool now when everybody needs a place to swim? 
I heard something. He stared up at a noisy mockingbird perched in the shade tree in front of the library. Anybody watching Frankie would have sworn that mockingbird was the most interesting critter in the universe. About cracks needing fixing. Nobody's closing our pool. Where did you hear that? My daddy. But it's a secret, Frankie answered. And he headed off like he hadn't said a thing. Your daddy? What does he know? I raced after him, all the while thinking, why in tarnation would our pool be closing on the hottest day of the summer, just 12 days before the 4th of July, my 12th birthday? And what was the big secret, anyhow? So we learned how Glory is our main character. It says it's right before her 12th, or 12 days before her 12th birthday, which is on the 4th of July. So we know right now she's 11 and she's almost 12. Frankie is her best friend, so we can infer that he's probably about the same age as her. And he says that he heard something from his dad. Well, the pool might close. They might have cracks to fix. And she's like, I haven't heard anything about that. So Frankie walks off like he didn't say anything because it was supposed to be a secret. He wasn't supposed to tell Glory anything. So now we're going to read Chapter 2, Spying. It says, Hanging Moss Community Pool Rules. Open 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Everyone welcome. No one under the age of 12 allowed in without supervision and no horseplay. So we know that Glory right now is 11. She's 12 in 12 days. So in like a week and a half, almost two weeks. And it says no one under the age of 12 without supervision. So when she said Jesslyn is there, Jesslyn is her sister. And she has to be there at the same time as her. Otherwise, she can't swim until her 12th birthday. See there, Frankie? Your daddy doesn't know everything. It's still open. I read the sign on the fence gate for the umpteenth time. You suppose they'll ever change that rule that makes my bossy big sister in charge? Just Lynn can't swim half as good as me. Just because she's 14 and I'm only 11, what difference does it make? You know, Glory, nobody has to know how old you are. You can just sneak in. Frankie looked around to see if anybody was watching us, like me. Not hardly. Since my daddy's been the preacher at the First Fellowship United Church for my whole entire lifetime, half the people in this town know how old I am. I untangled a quarter from my bathing cap and dropped it in the sign-in table. Let's go, I said, and followed Frankie to our special place near the back fence. We sat down on the grass. I flipped my tennis shoes to the side of my towel and looked out at the pool. Eight ladies floated on their backs in a big circle, one foot in the air and then another kicking away to some older-than-the-hills songs blasting from the loudspeaker. Look at that. The Esther's hogging the pool again. Just Lynn says Mrs. Simpson named them after a movie star. My brother says old lady Simpson acts like she's the boss of the community pool. Frankie put his archy funny book down and nodded towards the swimmers. All those ladies have green hair, you know. Before he could quote from his fifth-grade science book about why chlorine turns hair green, I yelled, Last one in's a monkey's uncle, and jumped up. Frankie set his eyeglasses in his shoe for safekeeping. He took off the black and gold lanyard with a whistle hanging from it and laid it on top of his towel. And then Frankie fiddled with his swim goggles, fastened on his pink, past his pink plastic nose clip. And finally, he slid into the pool, face first. I dived in the deep end, flutter kicked over to Jessalyn, and then climbed up the ladder. When I got out of the pool, I stood close enough to drip on her. Hey, sis, I'm here. Just Lynn turned from our pep squad friends. I see you. Please move. You're blocking my son. She slathered baby oil on her arm. Want a hot dog from the snack bar, I asked. I'll get you one and french fries. Just Lynn looked at me like I'd offer her liver with onions. Last summer, my sister taught me to hold my breath and swim the entire length of the pool underwater. Back then, we sat on the same big towel while she painted my toenails pink. But not this summer. This summer, Jesslyn was fed up with me. I cannonballed back in, splashing Jesslyn and her snippy friends. When I got out, I headed for my towel. Come on, Frankie, I told him. We got us some spying to do. Even underneath our favorite shade tree, it was so hot you couldn't hardly breathe. But when Jesslyn and her friends started whispering, and words like cute boy and football player and two-piece bathing suit drifted my way, I scooted my towel out from under the tree to get closer. They gossiped about her friend Mary Louise's party and talked about some new boy in town that Jess Lynn seemed real interested in. 
The way those girls were studying their fancy colored toenails, you would have thought that their paintings hanging in a museum. When Frankie's brother J.T. Smith, Mr. Football Hero, showed up, the toenail studying ended. Every single one of Jessalyn's pep squad friends started giggling and carrying on. Even with the sun beating down, J.T. had his varsity letter sweater slung over his shoulders. No swimming suit. I guess he was too good to go near the water. He had a toothpick hanging out of his mouth, a football under his arm, and the fiercest look on his face. Frankie jumped up and ran over to where JT was. Maybe he thought his mean big brother was going to make those boys playing Marco Polo, splashing left and right under the diving board, ask him to join in. Fat chance they'd let Frank Furter Smith play, even if his brother's the Hanging Moss Hornet's biggest star. You girls better enjoy this while you can, JT nodded towards the pool. He was grinning bigger than a cat trap and a mouse. By next week, it'll be closed. Jesslyn propped herself up on her elbows to look out at the turquoise water. Closed? In the middle of summer? You don't know what you're talking about, JT. When I heard that, I couldn't stop myself. I stormed over to Jesslyn. Nobody will close our pool. It's almost July 4th, the big parade and all. I started to say it was my birthday and how I'd had swimming parties here since I was little. But I didn't. I glared at Frankie's brother. Why are you lying about our pool? JT spit out his toothpick and slicked back his black hair. I ain't lying. You can blame it on those freedom workers, those people from up north in town to help the coloreds vote and swim in our pool. We don't need outside agitators down here making up new rules. JT started to move away from us. He was ending the conversation. Jesslyn followed JT towards the gate. I was right behind her. Her voice got so loud that two lifeguards looked down. Outside agitators? Do you even know what that means? You're just using big words. Before you start saying bad stuff about people, you should find out who these so-called outside agitators really are. My stomach did a belly flop. Whatever an outside agitator was, it didn't sound good. I didn't understand what they were arguing about. Well, if you want to swim next to a colored person, you go on ahead, JT hollered back at Jesslyn. While you're at it, why don't you just hightail it across town to swim in their crummy pool? Maybe I will, Jesslyn answered, quietly this time. But by now, the entire pep squad was listening. What are you talking about, JT? I looked up at him standing there, smiling to beat the band. You don't know a thing. That's what you think, he answered. And then he strolled out of the pool gate like he owned the place. For a minute, everything got so still that it felt like the entire Hanging Moss community pool was holding its breath, listening. After a while, it was swimming pool noises again. Mama's calling children, lifeguards whistles, radios fighting with each other to see which one could make the most racket. Everything back to normal, it seems like. I turned to Frankie. Is something broken? Is that what you meant by the pool might be closing to fix stuff? Like a crack in the cement? Must be a teensy crack, right? Or that fence over there by the mimosa tree? It's been broken ever since I can remember. Daddy told us it was closing, he answered. My daddy's on the town council, you know. Yeah, well, as the preacher of First Fellowship, my daddy knows as much as any old town council. He never said anything about this pool closing in the middle of summer. I kneeled down to peer into the pool. Water gurgling near the drains. Bobby pins, long-haired, and pink chewed-up bubblegum, but no cracks. I was trying not to care about swimming and splashing every single day for the rest of the summer in the cool water with Frankie, my one true friend. Or whether it mattered that Jess Lynn might just be the laughingstock of the hanging moss community pool for hollering at Frankie's brother. Listening to JT talk just now, all the fun had drained right out of the community pool. So we can see at the end of chapter two that JT, who is uh, Frankie's older brother, is kind of a bully. He walks in acting like he's too cool, like he owns the place, like he knows everything. And he's telling them, well, you better enjoy the pool because it's going to close soon. And he says that he doesn't want people from up north changing the way things are. So we can infer that if he's talking about people from up north, that they're in the south. And we know from reading Martin Luther King that in the South was where a lot of that segregation and that racism was and how up North things were much more equal. 
Um, and so we can see how Frankie is telling Glory that, well, there's a crack in the pool that it just has to be fixed. And my daddy's on the city council or the town council. So, so he knows it because that's what they talk about at their meetings. But JT is making us think that voice, hey, 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 come here, that it may be more than just something needing fixing, that maybe it's the mindset of people who are coming to change things that need fixing. So we're going to stop there. We're going to start next on chapter three for day two of Glory B. We'll see you guys next time.